and perfect. All right, and so let's see if anybody is waiting to come in. Going live. All right. Perfect, we've got some folks joining us now. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. And as you folks join, um, you know, feel free to at any point in the talk, ask a question in the chat. Um, and then if you're not comfortable, you know, uh, you can send it to me directly and I can read them out loud for you. But welcome to episode nine of Digging In. I'm Alice Prisco. I'm hosting today's talk. It's a series of live presentations with scholars from around the country, and it's co-sponsored by the Robert E. S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology and the Massachusetts Archaeological Society, which is where I come to you from. So we're going to begin with a little bit of a land acknowledgement for the land that the Peabody Institute and its school, Phillips Academy, are on. Phillips Academy occupies the land of the Penacook and the Pawtucket people and the lands of the contemporary Abenaki, Massachusetts, Wampanoag, Wampanoaki, Pocanoc, and Nipmuc nations. So we honor all the indigenous people who are here now, who have been here for time immemorial and who will continue to be here in the future. We acknowledge the indigenous genocide and the continued oppression of the native people, their voices, cultures, and spiritualities. We understand how education has been used by settler institutions and the attempted erasure of indigenous people. And so we commit to interrogating the histories and our complicity in colonization centering on native voices and communities. And we just wanna dismantle the ongoing legacy of settler colonization at Phillips Academy and beyond. Uh, so that's just something that we really are passionate about. Um, and we'd invite you to join us uh, every other Wednesday. I believe we have one digging in after this at 1.30 uh, through December for our presentations. You can visit us at peabody.andover.edu or the Massachusetts Archaeological Facebook page um, to get a schedule of date and presenters. And if you wanted to uh, expand your impact, you could become a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. That's through me. I do membership. <laughs> and we are able to bring you some great programming. Uh, and we just are so thankful for people who tune in like you. So today we are so excited to welcome Tara Titro and Suzanne Johnson. Tara has managed the Basil and Nancy Dorsey Archaeology Project for the Sugarland Ethno History Museum in Poolsville, Maryland. And she has over 20 years of experience in archaeology, curation, college teaching, artifact studies, and integrating archaeology into K-12 education, which is so important. And she heavily focuses on that K-12 education through her participation in the Smithsonian Institute the Global Humanities Institute, the UN Sustainable Development Teaching Fellowship, and the Scholarship for Excellence in Teaching. She also created the My, excuse me, Maynard Burgess House Archaeology Curriculum Module used to redesign the MC Summer Public Archaeology Program for Children and ran summer teaching programs. She now uses this expertise to train K-12 teachers at conferences on how to integrate archaeology into their teaching which as someone who works at an archaeology museum, I can tell you the kids need because they think mm. that we have dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> Suzanne Johnson is a retired kindergarten teacher and she's currently the president of the Sugarland Ethno History Project. She began her work shortly after retirement under Gwendora Reese, who created the project in 1995. So Gwen and Suzanne published one of the a few post-emancipation African-American history books with historian Jeff Sipak in 2020 and they recruited Tara to begin excavating at the site in 2021. With Gwen's passing in 2021, Suzanne recruited new board members and formed committees to raise awareness, uh, to renovate the museum's roof, purchase a storage room, and begin planning and fundraising to create a new Sugarland Museum. So again, if you have any questions, you can submit them straight to me or at the end we'll have time if you feel comfortable asking out loud. Um, so welcome, Suzanne and Tara. Thank you for joining us today. And I'll let you ladies take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Alice. Uh, again, my name is Suzanne Johnson. I'm uh, serving now as the president of the Sugarland Ethno History Project. Um, this is a passion for me for two ways. One, I, I love history and the other, I love genealogy. 
Um, and both of those passions are taken up with this project. Uh, Gwen, my cousin, started the project, like uh, Alice mentioned, in 1995. She grew up in what we call Sugarland, um, which is now part of Poolsville, Maryland, Upper Western Montgomery County, Maryland. Uh, it was a small town um, developed by former uh, enslaved people. They bought the land for the community uh, from former white landowners. The property that the church that you presently see now is on was purchased for $25 in 1871. The ch first church that was in Sugarland, which was the center of the community, was, uh, was burned and the present church that's standing now was built in 1893. The community was a true community. There were um, several, uh, a, a few families who bought land in the surrounding area. The church was the center, as I mentioned before. The community also had its own school, store, and post office, and a rehearsal hall because the community had a, a coronet band. The community grew and thrived together because the families helped each other. Uh, they helped with building their houses, harvesting food, butchering animals, um, and just generally supporting each other. The uh, community also had a well, and if you will, you will probably be able to see a picture of that well on the cover of our book that was mentioned. And uh, they all used that particular well until they, they dug their own. Um, the project, like I said, was spearheaded by my cousin Gwen who passed about a year and a half ago and we're really, really, really still missing her. Um, the name came out of a cooperation with Howard University back in, two, in 2005. And we are, were incorporated then as a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Our goal is to preserve the history of the community of Sugarland. And uh, it got its name. There's, there's two, there's a legend and the truth. The legend is that the town uh, was named Sugarland because the women there were so sweet. But the truth is, it's named after the beautiful sugar maple trees that, that surround the area. The church presently is not used as a church for regular services, but is used as a museum to house all of the artifacts and documents that um, my cousin Gwen initially um, preserved and created. The um, we have quite a few things that people who are from the community or have ancestors in the community will be able to come back and um, research their families. The church and the cemetery take up about two and a half acres of land. The cemetery has been documented. We have, uh, it's also been mapped. And that particular piece of land we found so far has over 348 people there. Um, anyone who is a descendant of the community will still be able to be buried there if they can show their direct descendants of the community. Uh, let's see. We do have, like I said, the building that right now that the church is on, I mean the church is serving as a museum. Our plans are to build a separate building Oh, I'm sorry, to replace a building that we had that is we everyone call the community hall. And that was that's where we plan to build a museum to, to house all our artifacts because our, our dream is also to keep the, the um, church as it was back in 1893. Um, we have done quite a few things. Gwen will be proud of us. Since she passed, we have a new roof on the church. And as it was being done, we found out that roof evidently was put on in 1893. No other roof had been put on there. We also are working on some renovations for the um, 
windows. And like I said, the building's almost 130 years old. So the windows need replacing. The original pews are still there that we would like to uh, refurbish. The floors we would like to refurbish. And there's, uh, we will just want to make it look like it did back in 1893. The history part, the genealogy part that I mentioned before, um, I have family roots there. My mother's branch of the family grew up there. My grandfather's property is still down the road from the church. And as a child, remembering walking up to, to the church and for different services. So that's, that's still um, very, very um, present in my memory. So um, I, Alice mentioned that I was a kindergarten teacher and I try very hard to slow down talking because kindergarten teachers usually tend to talk a little fast. So that's kind of the general background. Tara came to us uh, two years ago now to start the archeology span for the Basil, Nancy, Basil and Nancy Dorsey property, which is uh, the two acres directly adjacent to the church. That particular piece of property was given to us uh, by one of the community members because they wanted to help preserve what parts of Sugarland that we could preserve. So they uh, gave us that property. This past May, there were two more acres of property adjacent to that property that was also deeded to the um, Ethno History Project. So we're really proud that we have at least six plus original acres of the Sugarland community that was developed back in 1871. I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have, um, probably at the end, and I'll let Tara tell you all the exciting things that she's found in the last two years. Thank you so much for your time. Um, okay, thank you, Suzanne. I'm gonna, um... I'm not sure how to fix this. I'm trying to. Uh, my computer won't make, won't uh, progress. Won't, you know, I can't make the slides go forward. So I'm thinking. Um, I can stop share for a minute. Maybe that would just do it. I think if you try to stop and start, that might help. Stop. Okay. I don't know why it does this. I, yeah, I've came, done this in my classroom too. <laughs> it came right up when you. Uh, yeah, it did. I might just leave it like this if that's okay. You can see the slides on the side, but. That's absolutely fine. That's fine. Okay. okay. So I apologize for that. We have. Come on, you. Yeah, when I talk to it. So you can see the building that Suzanne was talking about um, and uh, the brief history of uh, the Basil, of Basil and Nancy, uh, of their life there on the farm. Um, Suzanne and I and Jeff Seipek have been working on over time. And um, I sort of broke it down into three sections of time, 1874, when Basil and Nan when Nan we believe Nancy first bought the property um, uh, and uh, when Basil and Nancy built their house. So, and then when they raised their children um, and given their children's ages, um, I capped that at 1885. And then really, you know, you see the oldest one get married and um, a little earlier, of course. So we have sort of three different time periods, 1887, uh, 74 to 85, and the 1880s, and then 1901 to 1909, when Basil and Nancy are getting on in years. Um, some of the interesting things I put under 1881 to 1900, you see that Mary, who was um, Basil and Nancy's uh, middle daughter, Mary, married the postman, uh, Nathan Johnson. And they lived near, you know, just on the other side of the property. And Horace Jackson married uh, their oldest daughter, Eliza, and had children. And they also lived right next door to the post office. So it's a pretty tight-knit tight, tight -knit community. Um, okay. 
But um, as Suzanne had mentioned, they brought me onto the site and said, we found these four cornerstones, Tara. We want you to see if that's, we believe this to be uh, Basil and Nancy's Dorsey's house, but we'd like you to test it and find out. And so that was really exciting to me to be, you know, asked to come and join them. And then also I had done uh, quite a bit on early African-American communities. So to, so to have this opportunity to excavate a real farm was just thrilling to me. Um, one of the things that wasn't available on the site were a lot of features, you know, fireplaces, uh, wood glass windows, uh, any raw material for building. Um, but one of the things that was really neat that was available to me was an interview from their neighbor, um, Tilman Lee, and he described the inside of the house. And this was just a wonderful thing to have when you had so few artifacts to pull from. Um, and he mentions how, you know, I put this in red, that there was a chimney that um, or stove flue that ran down. It was basically a single pipe that came down from the ceiling to this um, wood stove uh, that they've had planked in the middle of their house. So going with that, um, when I first measured the house size, it was about 14 feet by 10 feet. And so I'm looking at this rectangle and on one side, if you can imagine, is the well and a lot of woods. And then on the other side is some woods and you can see the church. So I'm thinking public face, private face, you know, of the house. So I divided it down the middle and thought, okay, let's assume then that the kitchen is on the public face and maybe the additions on the back. And that just, we were incredibly lucky with a lot of it, but that seemed to, to hold true. So on the kitchen side of the house, we excavated, um, you know, first I put in five typical test units, one in each corner and one in the center. But the one in the center didn't yield that much until I looked at Tillman Lee's interview and started thinking about what was he talking about? Where was the kitchen? And lo and behold, we excavated test units 11 and 18 and uncovered all sorts of food consumption and serving, medicinal bottles, um, food storage, um, and then a couple of, you know, things that make their way into the kitchen like you and I do today. We come home, we bring our stuff home, we put it on the kitchen table. So sometimes we find an agricultural tool or two. But, um, you know, so I put pictures of some of the artifacts. You can see the ironstone um, uh, plate, or it's probably a little bowl, a very, you know, not a very deep bowl. Um, that's that off-white piece. Um, there was a beautiful stoneware uh, jug with a metallic glaze, and I put the handle in that picture and some wonderful examples of salt, American salt glaze stoneware really big. Um, this one's a jug, but there were jars and all sorts of storage, food storage um, or water, you know, something you'd put outside to catch water. Um, and then the other things that I thought were really fascinating, not really up on the, you know, the, the most beautiful, but they were fascinating because it tells you so much. Um, and those were in the lower slide, the agricultural tool that you may have just brought in because it broke. Um, or for some other purpose, um, the items on the bottom to the long iron um, tools that I believe they used to stoke fire or to pull a, um, you know, the rack of an oven out um, or push it back in. Um, it had, they had little edges, rough edges on them. Um, and then the other thing that the piece of metal, um, they were actually like in a hoop shape, but they're clasps. And when I saw them, I was like, oh, wow, I had these growing up. And my mom had bought um, Sight Unseen, this old farmhouse when I was a really young kid. And when we went to the, to the kitchen, that's how they covered the cabinets, were with these, um, you know, um, small pieces of metal. And so I put a picture in to sort of imagine what it could have looked like in the Dorsey's house too. 
Um, and then we found a lot of uh, ginger beer bottles, which, and, but interestingly enough, they were ginger beer bottles. And then um, there's a big history about ginger beer um, bottles and how they evolve, I think, into something more like ginger ale, because they talk that over time, they took a lot of the alcohol out. And over time, they also go from a tan and cream color to a black and gray color. Um, I thought it was fascinating. I didn't really, this was stuff I sort of learned as I was doing the excavation. Um, but one of the things I noticed um, in excavating the kitchen side in particular were that when you came down to the bottom of the um, excavation unit, mind you that all that this was a building that had the wood building with a wood floor and that all the houses in Sugarland had a wood floor but they were on st built on stones. So um, I, I believe you put uh, the underneath the underneath that part uh, straight on the surface were these huge slabs of local stone. And I think the reason you put that down is to sort of uh, basically encourage water to go away from the house. Um, but I believe that's correct. Um, and down at that level, when we excavated the stone, um, we found the small Native American one cent piece that you see here. Um, and interestingly enough, it dates from 1859 to 1909, but um, the Dorseys were there from 1874 and then passed away beginning in 1907 and 1909. So I thought that was sort of interesting. Um, let me show you the rest of the house. Yes. Okay. So on the other side of the house, it, we had, oh, and one last thing with the kitchen, we found two prohibition bottles, which start to question, okay, so if Nancy and Basil passed away by 1907 and 1909, and you're fine pro prohibition bottles, somebody's there. So um, we're starting to look more at their son, John, or maybe uh, their daughter, Elizabeth. Elizabeth's the only one we haven't been able to find out, figure out where she left, who she married, or if she married, or uh, if she left the community. So those are the two that I'm pondering, and we'll be spending some time researching this fall. Um, so on the other side of the house, though, we had put in two test units in the corners on the uh, then would be the west side or the well side, and found one area that had a lot of, uh, I sort of liken it to socializing and entertainment. I mean, he had the, the kaolin pipe bowl, that long white clay pipe bowl, um, which um, they made really long pipes. I'm sure you guys know this by, uh, by 1850. Um, and so that was one piece that we found. We also, also found a marble. So, it, you know, there were a few artifacts that were saying entertainment, socializing, maybe relax area. Um, the bracelet was kind of neat, so I put that in there. But on the opposite corner, we found more, we found some um, work-related, housework-related type of items, but then personal items like, the belt buckle, the um, um, we found a bunch of buttons, but they were white workman buttons of different sizes. So maybe child and adult, which makes sense. You had at least one or two families living in the house in the very beginning. Um, what else am I missing? Oh, well, there's another piece of the metallic glaze. Oh, and the brass button. So we were out there excavating, and I remember Jeff was excavating the above test unit with a kale and pipe. And we found this brass button and, but it didn't have any, you know, it's plain, like you can see, it's just undecorated. There's no military insignia. And he brought up the idea that perhaps it was all part of the uniform for the um, Sugar Land, the local band. And then doing some research on, um, Eliza, the oldest daughter, and how she married um, Horace Jackson, uh, one of the local farmers. It says that, well, Horace Jackson 
was one of the organizers of the local band. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, so let me move on to the back door. So once we finished the interior, we moved outside and uh, one of our archeologists, Ron Nunn had excavated the back door and came down on a much deeper test unit than we had uh, found artifacts uh, for before, but also there was a, a midden area and in and around the test unit, he found uh, a Gouda Percha button, one of those, you know, it's a black plastic button, but it was dated to 1843. That would be the plain one. There was a really damaged one that I put in the picture um, just to say that there were a variety of Gouda Percha buttons and also the a variety of workman buttons. Um, but the really neat little artifact um, on the top left is a broken, what we believe to be a kid's china cup. Um, and it was the first evidence we've seen of children's toys. So, I mean, realize too, the, the site was pretty picked over um, when we got there and the family would have moved um, and then imagine too that probably people, when you move off your property, material gets reused. So that could be the reason for not finding things like the wood boards for the on the walls or the, you know, the hardware, I suppose. But um, it was really the only toy we found. So we thought that was really exciting. Um, and the uh, piece of onyx uh, necklace setting that you see in front of you was the other really exciting thing that uh, Jeff uncovered in this test unit. It was in the bottom of the sea. And um, the, I guess to me, one of the interesting things I'm ready for, hey, necklace, right? Except that there's no hole, there's no perforation, there's no evidence of even uh, a stone being set in, in the, um, the little, on the setting there. Um, I would have expected to see some so, some sort of discoloration or even evidence of the stone or glue that was used, but nothing. And then there was no hole for the attachment. Now, some people have said to me, well, couldn't you have wrapped string around it? And I, and I suppose, but when I took it around to some of the experts in the area, they said, Tara, that's, you know, you've got a piece of hoodoo. And I thought to myself, well, yeah, I, I guess I do. I do. It's not what it, where I would have gone first. Um, I guess I just hadn't, you know, you, you look at it and you say, well, it could be, but I don't know. Um, and so realize too, that in some African-American communities, black onyx is used to protect and to ensure safety for the future. Um, so like it's, you know, like other pieces of hoodoo, it is there to ensure strength into the future. Um, and, you know, I had to think about that for a while, but I was thinking that if I were new to freedom and it was 1874 and I had just got, gotten my first piece of land to build my first house, that I might want that security too, of just having a little extra protection. Um, so the fact that they invested in land, I think, is really important, that they were trying to steer their family away um, to having, um, you know, a better, a better life. Um, you know, I think these are the things that are really important when you see a piece like this. Um, and that is a common thread that I read about when I read Gwen and Suzanne and Jeff's book is that they spoke a lot about how, you know, even, the, even though these things have happened in the past, we are steering our children into the, to see the positive things that are going to happen in the future. Um, so but with that, I'm going to show you the, the last area we excavated. This was the addition. And, you know, I was saying I thought the addition would, would be on well on the well side. And the well is actually up, if you can see that tree in the distant 
at the top of the slide, um, but it's back up there. And um, so anyways, we put in several test units because we were finding quite a few stone features. And throughout those test units, we found a lot of animal bone, butchered animal bone, forks and knives and spoons of various types, um, and then buttons and, you know, uh, a thimble and things like that. So it was, there was definitely a personal space and a commonly used area, you know, whether it was used to help clean at some point or so during one part of the day and made, make dinner for another part of the day. But it was definitely used for, uh, you know, to help, help us do other things we need to do around the house. Um, and, you know, I guess I can't emphasize enough that by building that home, um, that, you know, the, the, the uh, Dorseys are really emphasizing that they had hope for, for their future and that this was a message they wanted to pass on to their children. Um, and, you know, that they would also do whatever they needed to do to make sure their children were successful. Um, and, and I guess my last point is that, or one of my last points is that by excavating the Dorsey site, we learned um, that there were a lot of things that that defy mod modern stereotypes. You know, like the fact that, that Jeff was able to pull up a deed that was written only to Nancy Dorsey, and that once they made their final payment, they created a new, de new deed that said Basil and Nancy Dorsey. But that just, that was the best. I mean, I thought that was super. I had been teaching women's studies for a while and it, I've been teaching about how land ownership was supposed to be awarded to women in the 1830s and 40s, but throughout the United States, it was very difficult to be, to actually realize. Um, so seeing the deed in her name was just super. Um, and we hope that by, um, publishing some of these the, these stories in the, the Sugarland book I have started for Canaan and in the archaeology teaching mo module for the Dorsey site um, that we're able to encourage new you know young new teachers or um, new a new generation rather um, to learn about some of the successes that early African American communities have had um, and we hope that they, that therefore the new generation will gain a new perspective of what African American people have achieved over the generations. And I'm happy to take any questions you have about the site. Thank you, ladies, so much. We did get a question in the chat, and you sort of just answered it, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, you had said it, the question was, what was the most unexpected thing to be found? So was it the deed with Nancy's name on it or was there something else that kind of really took you by surprise? Wow. Well, the the deed and the coin and that piece of black onyx really surprised me. I mean, I had I had read a lot about other what other archaeologists had found in terms of caches. And I thought, nah, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Um, and the coin was really cool. You always hear about that. I think it's one of like number one questions people ask archaeologists. Have you found any coins? And I have. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I guess you can both answer this one. Uh, Tara, if you'd like to answer it first, what's kind of your favorite thing that you found? Maybe not unexpected, maybe something that you had an inkling you'd find, but what really completes the history of the area and what's your favorite thing that you you've found so far? Wow. Um, wow. Well, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I maybe the child's teacup. Um, that was really neat to me. I had done a paper a long time ago in the nineties about reevaluating some native American artifacts at a site just below DC. 
and I suggested that they could have they these little objects could have been children's objects. And people, I don't think we were talking about children's objects back then. But there's been a lot in the literature in the past five or ten years. So maybe the teacup. <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much for sharing. Suzanne, do you have a favorite artifact that's been found or something that you were really excited that they unearthed? So Suzanne, do you want to turn your mic? Yeah, I got it. I forgot I had muted. Um, probably the buttons on the kids' clothes because I remember my grandmother also took in laundry and talking to Tara, we were thinking maybe that's where some of those might have come from. But just the buckles on the clothing and the coin, I think the fact that and we we did another uh, presentation and someone mentioned it might have been a freedom coin. So that was really special. Yeah, that I have to agree with you there that that mm -hmm. would be that's a really cool idea, you know, yeah. reasonable, you know, because oh. if they did, then they buried it under the house to make yeah. sure it was safe. Yeah. Lost it under the house. <laughs> We did get someone who raised their hand, um, Mike Lucas. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn your microphone on, Mike, if you've got a question. Like New York, Mike Lucas? I'm not sure. Hello, <laughs> Hello I am Mike Lucas. Uh, no, not from New York, um, from oh, okay. Lakewood, Lakewood, Ohio, actually. I am a professional archeologist by trade, currently a provisional student at John Hopkins University in a master's program. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks for talking. I uh, heard y'all um, talk at a New Jersey archaeology lecture, I believe, when you had just uncovered the black cameo and coin. I believe that y'all said that uh, the coin, you hadn't much details about it yet. You gave a little bit more details about it here because I guess you had more time to lab work with it and stuff like that. But uh, I believe it was, y'all told me it was found in context with the black orb a little bit because it was like found within the doorway of the house and the black orb, the cameo was in the center of the house. And, you know, like that is a common place for like, you know, where coins would get dropped by the porchway. But then, uh, you know, I also said that like down in uh, Louisiana and New Orleans, like coins could be freedom tokens and stuff like that as well and just like the context of it being in the doorway I believe was just like you know it could be in conjunction with the black cameo mm -hmm. also um next thing is uh the ch uh, child's uh chinaware cup is a really interesting because chinaware has always been an indicator of, st of status there's even like a whole series of pseudo Chinaware by all the different colonial powers that occupied the uh, so called United States. But um, just the fact that it's like, you know, within a kid's playset is like they're kind of like, you know, like sending a, me a social message, a social like learning message through that child's playtime that like it's okay to hold yourself to a higher standard and stuff like that. And I think that's just like really beautiful as freed uh people of color and stuff like that and uh yeah i don't want to info dump too much longer i'll leave y'all with my in uh email because i really would like to collaborate with y'all in the future i visited the uh church and cemetery once and have read your book thank you very much all right thanks awesome thank you so much mike does anybody else have any questions for suzanne and tara or you can raise your hand uh, or in the chat, you can send a message. They did a great job kind of answering all of my questions before I <laughs> asked them. So <laughs> I'm sure that happened for the rest of you as well. All right, well, ladies, I wanna thank you so much for joining us today and teaching us about this. This is so important. I think it's great. Um, you know, that you were able, Suzanne, that you have such a personal connection to this project. I think that's really beautiful and that you're honoring the legacy of your cousin and Tara, that you're able to come in and give a lot of context to things that we wouldn't know about. And, you know, uh, Fried, Friedman history is often ignored and, and not spoken of. And so giving it a voice is, is so important. And I'm so thankful to both of you for that. I do appreciate it so much. 
Um, if anybody would like to send me an email as a way to get in touch with Tara or Suzanne, you can just send it to my first and last name, which is Alice Prisco. It should be there in the little chat box um, at Gmail. And then I wanted to thank you all for joining us today. If you are interested, we do have one more talk of our Digging In series, Wednesday, December 9th, and we're going to be joined by Jessica Bowes, who will be speaking about preservation at the Harriet Tubman National History Park. So um, a little bit of continuation on the theme, but on a, a larger scale. Um, this one was nice because it was so personal. <laughs> uh, so again, we wanted to thank everybody, thank our speakers and thank the viewers and welcome you to check out our website at Mass Archaeological Society um, and consider becoming members. We hope to see you soon. All right, thanks again for having us. Thank, thank you, you very much, guys. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, enjoy ladies. All right.